Welcome everyone to a special edition of Uptime Community. Our guest today is Joe Jordan. He is the president and co-founder of CE4 Research Group, an alien abduction investigation and research team. Joe has been a Mutual UFO Network or MUFON field investigator since 1992. He has uncovered what may be some of the most controversial and challenging evidence in over 70 years of UFO research. He has shared his research on numerous radio shows, newspaper and magazine articles, DVDs and lectures. His research findings on alien abductions have been written about in over 35 different, different authored books. He has spoken during six Roswell UFO festivals in Roswell, New Mexico, including the 60th anniversary conference in 2007. He has also hosted the Roswell UFO Festival Conference for the city of Roswell in 2008. He has been featured in the documentary, Alien Intrusion, Unmasking and Deception, produced by Gary Bates, the founder of Creation Ministries International. CE4 Research Group has been the investigative arm of alienresistance.org, a clearinghouse website covering the biblical view on the UFO phenomenon. Seeing that there seemed to be a spiritual nature to the alien abductions and experience, they posed the question, are Christians being abducted by aliens? On this program, we will be covering his latest book, Piercing the Cosmic Veil. It's been co-authored by Jason December and his new show titled Under the Same Name. Thank you, uh, Joe, for coming on with us. Sure. Uh, and, um, it's It's been a long time. It's been a long road. As you know, uh, we've known each other for, man, uh, over a decade, uh, but you have uh, certainly come up with more research, more findings, revelations in regards to this phenomenon. Um, the book, The Piercing the Cosmic Veil, uh, is available uh, on Amazon, and I believe it's also on barnesandnoble.com. And uh, trust me, you you will want to read this book. It is, uh, it is chock full of not only the research and findings of, of Joe Jordan and uh, Jason, December, but also has numerous testimonies of people who have completely gotten rid of and have been delivered of this phenomenon and these abduction case scenarios by calling on the name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, or also known as Jesus, the Messiah. So, um, Joe, I know that you have a number of things that you want to um send out to our audience a message that is really hasn't been spoken of yet and uh, i am very excited to hear about what you have to say because this is this is the time for it to come out i believe every there's a time and a place for everything and the lord is in charge of that and um, i'm grateful to have you on and to uh, discuss this new revelation that you've you've had. And uh, please let the audience know a little bit more about your background and how you came to the Lord and how you're doing the ministry you're doing now. Okay. Um, just to finish up from your intro there, just to let people know, uh, we had the book come out um, in paperback form last July, and it's doing well on Amazon. And those are the stats I do see, because that's who I went through for publication. And we just had it put out in Kindle. So it is available in Kindle form for those that want it digitally on their iPads or um, you know, their laptops or whatever they use for digital form that prefer it that way. So it's available that way too now. So uh, we try to cover the bases. And I'm also looking at, I've, I've been asked and I'm looking at possibly putting it together here uh, myself into an audio form for those that like to listen while they're driving or you know, listen at work, you know, that type of situation. Be a little bit of a chore, something I never thought about, but um, I'm willing to give it a try. So we'll see. All right. Where did this all start? Um, it's been 25 years, 26 years now. Uh, way back, it started on a vacation trip, believe it or not. Um, I had no interest in this subject matter. UFOs, aliens, that's farthest thing from my mind. I worked a uh, hard worker, just a blue collar worker most of my life. I was a welder, fabricator, um, mechanic. I did uh, 
24 years with a major boat company. Now, pretty much the biggest boat company in the world there in Florida. And my focus was the weekend, getting together with friends, raising my son. You know, that was the main things in life. I wasn't focused on other th interests like, you know, this stuff. And uh, I would have classified myself at that time as probably an agnostic humanist. You know, I was I went to public school. I got those teachings of, um, you know, the, the facts of evolution. Oh, wait a minute. That's a theory, right? Uh, I didn't know that. I thought it was a fact back then. <laughs> And then I took this vacation trip in 1992. My son was uh, six years old at the time and uh, took him with me and took my mom with me too. Got these free tickets uh, through in some event that uh, I acquired three three round trip vouchers, free good for anywhere in the US, continental US. Well, Alaska's continental US. So I said, let's take as far as I can go. And luckily I had Younger brother, uh, career man in the Air Force, stationed at Elmendorf in Alaska. I said, going to go visit my brother in Alaska. Never been to Alaska. I've been to 15 countries by that time in my life because uh, I grew up an Army brat. Traveled all my life growing up until high school. <clears throat> Look forward to traveling again. Been a while. So I said, let's go. Let's go visit my brother. He was married, had two kids, my son's cousins. My mom hadn't seen, you know, his family in a while. So I said, let's go. I got nine days and my mom can stay with my son up there. They plan on staying for a month. So we're flying out of Orlando Airport. Uh, back then it was kind of pre-digital. People can imagine that. Younger guys there listening to this or watching this can imagine a pre-digital world. Um, we didn't have all them things on an airplane back then. And I figured I better get me a magazine or a book to read on a 10 hour flight to Anchorage. So I went to the kiosk there at the Orlando International Airport, looking around, trying to find something to read, keep me busy for a while on the plane. Didn't see anything in the magazines interest me, you know, shotgun news or something like that, you know, keep my interest conservative gun owner I was at the time. And uh, so I went over to the book section. When I was younger, I was an avid science fiction reader. I love science fiction. Science fiction is uh, escapism, you know, like any fiction. Pick mm -hmm. up a book, you dive into it, and the world disappears around you. You know, you can go anywhere you want to go. In science fiction, you go to other worlds, you know. Uh, you just take off. You're in another universe, you know. You you're not on Earth anymore. Yeah, you're escaping. You're escaping. Yeah, from the, it's, out, it's the great. Hour. Yeah, yeah. That's what we did back when I was younger. You know, we didn't have. Well, I lived overseas, so we didn't have American TV and all that, you know, to watch. So I got into science fiction books. You know, there's some great authors out there back then. Still, some good ones out today too. So I went looking for something, past the time, good science fiction book. I'm looking, looking. They didn't see anything that caught my attention. I kept looking, found one book. I looked at the cover of it and I thought, hmm, looks like science fiction. I turn it over, read the synopsis on it. It don't read like science fiction, but it looks like science fiction. It says it's a you know a science fic it's a science investigation of an event that happened in Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947. It said it was you know about a a downed alien craft. Come on, aliens are science fiction. This doesn't make any sense. How can they investigate something that's science fiction? Don't make no sense. So I bought the book just for giggles. I got into this book, started reading it. It just hooked me like, you know, a, a big fish. And I just started consuming this thing till I got to the last page. And I thought, hmm, I got to know more about this stuff because this don't make no sense. 
you know, there's a definite big, thick black line that separates reality from fiction. But this book just took that big, thick black line and just grayed it over where you couldn't tell one edge from the other. Well, that's not supposed to happen. But I had to go figure out why this was happening. Well, it just so happens when I got back from this trip, I'm watching a local TV news station. And they have this little show that they do, uh, just a few minutes, where they advertise new businesses in the area. It was out of Orlando. And uh, they, <laughs> it just coincidental that when I got back, they're advertising this UFO museum just opened up on International Drive. That's where all the tourist stuff is in downtown Orlando. And this guy's opening up a UFO museum on a second floor in this little strip mall there. High traffic, tourism. And he's got this new gimmick. And I'm going like, oh, maybe he knows something about this stuff. I have to go check him out. It's only 45-minute drive. And I figure I'll take a Saturday ride over, see what he knows. So I did. Went over and talked to him. Next thing I know, I find out that this guy is uh, was state section director for Mutual UFO Network, largest grassroots UFO research organization in the world. State section director means he runs the organization local chapter for Orange County, Florida. Okay. Come to find out, all the different counties or groups of counties have a state section director. States have a state's director. Um, sometimes a group of states have a state director for, you know, all of them together. It depends how, you know, many people they can get involved. Then there's international directors. And uh, then there's the head director himself, you know, of the whole organization. He told me there's probably three, 4,000 people worldwide that are part of this organization. Researchers, consultants. And the whole thing is they go after this idea of this blurred line <laughs> that I'm seeing here of uh, so-called alien ships people are seeing or crashing or whatever. And they research them and investigate them scientifically. Um, I'm good with scientifically. Okay. I could go for that. That way you get a real answer, you know? Not just, well, I believe in these things. No, I don't go for that. <laughs> but show me some evidence? Yeah, I'll take that. Didn't see any yet. A lot of people talk about it. Didn't see any, but I figure if this is the way to find it, I wouldn't mind joining this outfit. So he introduced me to it. I joined in 1993. Still a member. They trained me up to learn how to do investigations, became a field investigator for them. Next thing I know, I'm becoming the state section director for my county, and I'm training up field investigators to help me out. My county was Brevard County, Florida. That happens to be the county where the Kennedy Space Center is located. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought to myself, after a while, how cool is that? I got the county that's probably one of the highest air security areas in the world. They got one heck of a no-fly zone because they don't want nothing flying over those pads. This was during the shuttle area, shuttle time. They can't have anything coming in there. So I thought, how cool is that? They ain't going to get no sightings over my county. But, you know, they did. Lots of them. <laughs> that was interesting. Lots of stories there, but not for this show. But I'll tell you, they did have sightings there. So that started me out in this whole thing. I'm still not seeing any evidence, though, just reports. To do a sighting investigation, you get a report that comes in, police department, sheriff's department, newspaper, you know, they call these people thinking that they got to report something, and these people, they're going, 
We don't do these things. We don't follow up on this stuff. We'll do an article on it maybe, but we're not going to follow up on it. We're not set up to do this. So we made ourselves known that we do. So that's how this works. MUFON makes themselves known to the local organization. Say, hey, if somebody calls up, says they got something, don't just laugh. Or if you do laugh, at least call us after you're done laughing because we'll follow up on it. So that's kind of how that works. So they call us, say, hey, uh, these guys called up, said they're seeing weird lights. So you guys want it? Yeah, we'll take it. So we go out, we investigate. Is it always something worthwhile? Nah, not all the time. Just so you know, the statistics after all these years stays the same. And MUFON will tell you, the organization will tell you, 98% of reported sightings that people report, and there's lots of them, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands, the report I get every month, every month from MUFON, which is averaging anywhere between 425 to 500 sighting reports a month um, documented. That that's a lot. 98, yes, a lot. There's probably more that aren't being documented, but that's just documented. So add that up a year and a year after year after year. So that's just move on. Um, 98% of all of those, they will say, are basically misidentified sightings. That means people are misidentifying seeing a natural phenomenon or a man-made phenomenon, okay? What captures the researcher's attention is that 2% that behaves strangely, that seems to defy God's laws of physics. You know, there's there's God's laws of physics, and then there's science fiction's laws of physics, okay? Mm -hmm. Like warp drive. Um, that's not God's laws of physics. That's science fiction's laws of physics, okay? There's just some things that they talk about that they think they can do that it ain't going to happen, okay? There's, there's physics that just won't be abused, okay? There, there's, that's the realm of science fiction. And that's where that line still gets grayed today. You know, people think that they're going to be able to do this and that. You know, there's things that just, they're not going to happen, okay? So many, many years I was state section director. One of the requirements of a state section director, by the way, besides doing training up field investigators so you can take care of sightings and all that, is they want you to uh, help in membership for the organization. Membership and organization does two things. It helps build up more investigators, which helps address more sighting reports, which helps get hopefully closer to an answer to what the phenomenon actually is. That's the whole idea, okay? Um, MUFON was founded in 1969. Do they have an answer? No. Chew on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The other one is it helps funding. Because MUFON is a 501c3. They, uh, it's all volunteer. They, they, you, as a member, you can come in at the lowest journal subscriber and you pay a monthly fee for the journal, which is excellent. I don't have one here right now, but the journal is a beautiful, hang on. You know, I will promote MUFON. I got to tell you, I've been with them 25 years. This is their beautiful journal. I mean, it is. It, it's absolutely in color. It's, you know, it's glossy finish. It's all the way through. It's, it's great. They got investigations in here, the whole thing. 
it, it's it's come a long way over the years. You want to study the real phenomenon? MUFON's got it. The journal, just being a journal subscriber is worth it. You want to do real investigations and have the tools and the people behind you, consultants that are just a phone call away or an email away, PhDs that you can talk to that are real scientists when you got a question that you don't understand, they're right there. That's what this organization's about. Okay. Do the if you want to really dig into this, there's a whole world of support group with this organization. Use them. You know, you don't have to do this by yourself. I didn't. I used yeah. what was available and it got me some answers. Um and they do allow for uh any type of let's say sighting that someone has that can be documented easily that can just be put into the files and they will they the way will, it yeah go ahead. It, it used it was done differently when i first started um we didn't have the the computer back then you know still right at the beginning of the of the internet um back then you'd get a phone call to headquarters um that was in seguin texas at the time um past few years it's been in california now it's moved to indiana um used to be you call the headquarters hotline and then depending on where the call was coming from they would take the chart on where the state director was at they'd call that state director where the call was coming from the state director would go down his list to the state section director where the person was calling from say hey you got a sighting just came in send somebody after it. That's the way it worked 20 years ago. Now <clears throat> you go right online, MUFON.com, M-U-F-O-N.com. You go right on there, report a sighting, goes right into the database. You hit enter when you put your basic info in, boom, it goes right to the place it's supposed to go to, okay? Instantly goes right, if it's to me, I'm, I'm a national director for South Korea, by the way, that's where I live. Um, if you if you're in Korea and you got a sighting here, I'm going to get the alert. Okay, that's how that's how it works. And go after the do the report. It's that quick nowadays. Okay, it's all done. Everything you put the information in, I take the information you put in. I contact you and follow up with it to get a full contact report, either by phone by video like this or face-to-face -face if, if at all possible and actually get to the location to, you know, to understand the perspective and, you know, everything else that's even better. The more information you can get to build the case, you know, the, the better understanding of what actually they were seeing, you know. Keep in mind, you're always after the fact, okay? That's something that I want you to understand here. Um, it's always after the fact. Well, these meetings I had to hold also. Um, the meetings were to, I was required to at least hold one a month, and that was to build membership drive also. And also to do that by sharing information about the organization and about ufology to the public. Well, I'm thinking, where am I going to hold a meeting at, you know? Uh, and a buddy of mine told me about, free access that the library gives you as long as you're not charging money. So I went down, talked to the uh, Coco Library, which is right in the middle of Brevard County where I live. And it's a huge library, beautiful, all brand new. I went down there and I talked to the people there and they said, yeah, we got these big, big meeting rooms. They're huge. And uh, probably hold, you know, 75 people easy. And do uh, you need any, you know, visual, um, visual, you know, aids to use, uh, TV, VCR, all that stuff. And I said, uh, yeah, you offering it? He said, anything you need that we have is yours to use for your meetings. Wow. Here we go. So one Sunday at last Sunday of the month in the afternoon, I would hold my meeting. And I did first one. I advertised it in the local paper and I put a sign on the door that said, 
UFO meeting open to the public. Think about that for a second. Free to the public. Think about if you ever did that. Who would show up? Mm. I mm. didn't think much about that at the time. <laughs> but, yeah, you get a different bunch of people show up <laughs> for a meeting like that. Uh, I really wasn't prepared for that. Our group ended up being anywhere from, you know, 25 to 70 people at any given time. Quite an experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they all had a story to tell. All of them. And they thought we were the experts. <laughs> we weren't the experts. They were the experts. They were the experiencers. We weren't. You know, right. but they had it backwards. They thought we were the experts and they wanted us to give them answers. Well, we were looking for answers. <laughs> so once we convinced them that, you know, they had it backwards and we were there to help them in any way we can by learning from them, then we started building a good rapport. And we started getting them to talk to us and letting us record them and learn from them and build a database of information to where we could start cross-referencing between them to try and see if there were similarities. And it's kind of similar to what I do in uh, my profession that I do now, which is I'm a safety professional. So uh, as you record accidents and incidents in the workplace, you're looking for similarities, causes, you know, so you can eliminate those causes. Um, looking for frequency, you know, uh, of um, times that may show up that are the same, you know, and try to find out what, why the same time or, you know, why the same day or, you know, things like that. So queries you're running on it is what it's called, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can find out what the major drive of it is. So we start listening to these people and there's one group of the people that, really caught our attention with their stories. And these people were absolutely miserable. You know what I mean? I mean, these people, they hated life. They were just, you know, I mean, by the time I got done listening to them, I was miserable. And these people, everything was wrong. Their lives had been turned completely upside down. They'd lost their friends. They'd lost their jobs. They'd lost their families. All because something had happened to them that they had tried to talk about. And it was such a bizarre experience that sharing it just turned everybody away. And... That was the alien abduction experience. You know, UFOs was one thing, okay? People seeing things in the sky, but come on. Yeah. People being taken aboard a ship in the night. Yeah. Now you're stretching this old guy's, you know, limit. Mm -hmm. But hey, it's part of the same phenomenon, so I got to look at it. So we did. We started looking at it. We started listening to them. And then I realized something clicked in my mind logically. And I told my investigators, I said, guys, come here. I got this idea. I said, there's something here that I'm seeing. We're chasing lights in the sky it's like a dog chasing his tail. I said, yet we come to our meetings and we're sitting here listening to people that have been in contact with the people, well, with whatever it is, the entities that are piloting the ships that we're showing up after the fact for, not even seeing them. I said, uh, you know what I'd call these people that were in our meetings? These are front line. Mm. I said, we're investigating the wrong thing. 
I said, now listen, we can't stop doing an sighting investigation, but I think our major focus should be with these people. These people are in contact with the darn pilots of these ships and the occupants. Right. We need to talk more to them and get to, I think if we're going to get an answer, it needs to be here. Okay. And they all, they all saw it. I said, yeah, you're right. And I said, well, a couple things here. We got to, got to check out. First of all, you guys realize these people are really hurting. Uh, yeah, we know that. I don't even like talking to them. I said, yeah, me neither, but we got to if we're going to do this. I said, so here's what we need to do. We need to learn as much as possible about this phenomenon so that we don't do any more damage to these people if we're going to work with them. Okay, sounds like a plan. So we went out and we got all of the literature, the videos, everything we could get our hands on on the researchers of that time that were dealing with abductions and just consumed it so that we felt that we were at a point that we could actually work with them and not hurt them in any way, you know, not say the wrong things and know what to ask, you know, when to ask and be able to carry this research on. The other problem with this we had to deal with was MUFON was not set up to do with abduction research. At the time, they had one gentleman that was kind of handling that for them, um, John Carpenter out of Springfield, Missouri, um, that was kind of doing that kind of work. He was a, uh, uh, a hypnotherapist that was uh, working with abduction, you know, abductees. And um, he was taking on that task for MUFON, but there was no organized way to investigate the abduction at the time, like there is for a sighting. There's no chart of questions and all of that right. to take them through. So we figured we'd just document the testimonies and, and get them on file and look for similarities like the other guys were doing, the other uh, people in the field were doing. At least do that much. But we couldn't actually do it as MUFON, you know, because MUFON doesn't do that. So that's when we, I said, look, let's, let's set up another research entity, but let them know that we are MUFON members and investigators so that at least they understand and accept our credibility as researchers because they trained us, okay? They would recognize that we're doing this the right way because you trained us to do it the right way. You trained us how to do scientific investigation. You trained us how to go through a, a, a process of looking at something and getting answers. So that's what we were going to stay on track with. And we agreed that we would never hide anything. We would make it public all the time. And absolutely make it available for MUFON to look at at any time they asked for peer review. In other words, that's what it's called. Um, they said, we're all cool with that. So my lead investigator that I had at the time, him and I come up with um, putting together what's called um, another one, CE4, where am I headed? CE4 research. And that's who we are still today. Um, that was uh, one of my experiencers was uh, an artist and she drew that and gave it to me to use and I've used it ever since and been using that for 20, 20 years now. And uh, it's it's a quite a concept on um, representing the experience. And uh, her name was Penny. And uh, that was before I came to the truth on what I have found what this is. But great logo. And uh, still captures people's attention. Um, yeah, great. This yeah. one over here that you see, this is the new one that my son come up with. And uh, we're kind of bringing that one into play also. A um, little more modern. 
that we can put out there. But it's, you'll see it on my YouTube channels if you look at it. Um, so as we started doing this, there was another thing we started recognizing. And I recognized it when I first visited the UFO museum. Something clicked, and I thought, you know, I saw something in that museum that just made no sense to me at all. The museum, when I walked through it, the way he had it set up, you know, he had no evidence of anything in there, no, nothing alien in it. It was a, um, a museum of information. It had aisles that you went down, and it was the total history of the UFO phenomenon. And it was great stuff that he had collected, articles and newspaper clippings of, you know, famous stuff. I mean... Everything you needed to know about the history of ufology was in that museum. It was great, you know, and uh, never forget it. Yeah, Jim and Mary were their name. They great couple that, you know, great to talk to, too. My first sighting that, uh, first major sighting ever went on, uh, I had to call Jim in on it with me. And uh, yeah, that was, that's a story to tell <laughs> uh, another time. But at the end of the thing, when you finish, you come out by the counter, and he had a, a, a counter with books and magazines and all sorts of UFO stuff there that you could purchase to read. But there was some some there that didn't make sense to me. I mean, already it didn't make sense to me, but to mix in this religious spiritual stuff with you ufos it's like uh that's a little too far-fetched i don't even want to ask why that's in here well mm -hmm. here it reared its heads again because something i started noticing listening to these people that were the abductees that were miserable is that they were trying to hang on to something to keep their sanity in a some kind of hope in any way, you know, to deal with this. And it was some kind of spirituality that they had come across. Well, you know, agnostic humanist, you know, I don't deal in spirituality, but I had to look at it. It was connected to this somehow. This is the second time I come across it. Well, I got to tell you something. MUFON warned me about these people that deal in this stuff. They said that you're not to have any part of this because this is something we can't investigate. So kind of steer clear of it. And you'll come across it, but kind of keep that at bay. Mm. So I'm remembering that, but yet it's here, and it's the second time I come across it. So I'm thinking, logical guy again, I am, an investigator. Well, if I'm trying to look at the whole picture, why would I not look at a piece that belongs in the picture? Right. Maybe I just won't tell MUFON. Yeah. That sounds like a true investigator, actually. <laughs> yeah. So we look at it. I look at it especially. Why is this connection there with these people? And what is this connection? Well, this connection is a pseudo-spiritual connection called metaphysics and or New Age. And it's sort of, sort of, in their minds, a kind of hope that they had come across. Well, let me put it this way. When I started to ask them about it, why is why is this stuff here? Why why are you looking at this? And the answer was is it was the only source that was willing to help them. Hmm. hmm. Well, if you if you're looking at some kind of spiritual help, what's wrong with regular organized religion? Oh, they, they didn't want to help us. Really? Okay, duly noted. So, if this 
people are willing to help you. There must be something to it. Well, we're looking into it. We're trying everything. Well, maybe I need to look into it too. So I did. So I started looking deep into it to find out what they were involved in. How am I going to understand what they're dealing with if I don't look into it? So that's what investigators do. Right. Well, next thing I know, over the next four years, I end up becoming, besides a UFO investigator, I become a new age metaphysical practitioner. I jumped into it, hook, line, and sinker. So when I started out in this, looking at this UFO phenomenon, I was looking at it through the glasses of agnostic humanist. That was my perspective, my worldly perspective. That's what most UFO researchers look at this, this UFO phenomenon from. I've had that opportunity in every way possible of looking at it. I looked at it from an agnostic humanist viewpoint. Then I had the opportunity of a conversion into the new age and metaphysical realm. So I spent four years looking at this from a new age metaphysical worldly perspective. <laughs> a lot of people don't get two perspectives to look from. Most people live one perspective. I've had the opportunity to look at this phenomenon from two different viewpoints. That really opens up to what this stuff looks like. For real. But in 1996, November of 1996, in a troubled time that year, I was very busy. A lot of stuff going on. The book covers uh, that period, and uh, you'll see a lot of stuff was going on. But I had a girlfriend at the time. I wasn't married. Raising my, my son, though. And uh, I was a weekend dad with my son. And uh, I had this girlfriend at the time. She was an artist. She was actually friends with this girl, uh, Penny. Good friends. They are both artists. And she was working with us as a investigator because most of your abductees alien abductees are women and a lot of the things that are done to them are very very sexual in nature well it's very uncomfortable if not dangerous to sit one-on-one -on -one with a woman as she tells you these sexual things that goes on during these experiences mm -hmm. so don't do that. Have a woman <laughs> present um, or let the woman do the investigation for you and just give you the information when you're done, which is what we did. Um, mm. Yeah, she was willing to do that part. So that was perfect. Now, one thing we agreed on is um, she was a professing Christian. I was a crystal rolling new ager. We agreed to not mix certain things, religion and politics. It's like oil and water. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't mix. No. So we stayed straight and narrow, didn't get into those areas until she saw that I was having some real problems and she felt that it was related to some cases I was working on. So she pulls me aside one Saturday morning and she says, you know, um, I see you're having problems. You're, you're worn out. You're stressed. And I think it's pretty much related to some of these cases you're working on. I think they're very dark in nature. I don't think you're seeing it. And I said, she says, I think you need some protection. And uh, I reached in my pocket. I pulled out my little bag of gemstones. 
You know, rocks can protect you, right? They got all different <laughs> powers. Yeah, right. I used to think that. A lot of people still do. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, it protected yeah. David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every, yeah, different That's kind of stone. It. That was <laughs> about it. Kind of stone. <laughs> yeah. I thought they were protecting me. And she says, no, I mean real protection. I said, well, what are you talking about? She, she reaches over and grabs her Bible, and she says, it's in here. And I said, wait a minute. We agreed not to mix. She says, uh, no, it's in here. I need to show you. I said, no, we agreed not to do that. And she says, well, let me remind you of something. You also tell everybody that you're the most open-minded, objective investigator there is. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I just been had. <laughs> she got you there. <laughs> yeah. So I said, all right, I give you 15 minutes. That 15 minutes was my life changer. I heard the gospel in a way that I had never, ever heard it before. I grew up in a church up until the time I was a senior in high school when the world pulled me away. I'd never made a profession of faith the whole time, but I was part of a church. I was part of the youth group. Both my parents, my family was, uh, you know, believers, but just never made the made the connection. So here I am, forty two, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, nineteen ninety six, November, right there in her living room. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And I said, now what? Now I'm a Christian. But I'm still an investigator. And I'm still curious. I want to know everything. So I talked to my partner that helped me find CE4, my lead investigator. You know what? He was a Christian too. Of course, we didn't talk about religion either. He was all happy now that his partner was a believer. But obviously, he thought it was okay to chase aliens too, you know? So did my, did my girlfriend. So it must be okay as Christians to chase aliens. Hmm. Here we go. We just keep going, right? But I still want to learn about God. I want to learn about Jesus. I don't know nothing about him, really, except what I a little bit I remember from school and, you know, when I was a, in growing up. That was a long time ago, you know. So my partner says he worked at the Space Center. He worked on the shuttle program. I was still at the boat company. He says, I got this partner I work with that's got this awesome study program. He says it's on VHS tapes. He says um, there's 14 of them, two hours long. He says we can take one a night and meet at his place, and we'll watch, and it'll take you through it. Bring you right up the par and know everything you need to know in a hurry and not have to sit through 50 Sunday sermons and maybe learn this. I said, man, that's what I'm talking about. I want to know what a Christian is right now. So it just so happens that my job and their job had two weeks off during the um, Christmas and New Year's holiday period. So we decided to sit every night over at his buddy's house and go through a tape a night. Oh, man, this was just phenomenal Bible study stuff, all delivered by this guy on videotape. We're sitting in his living room, the three of us, and good stuff. And uh, we get to this one night, and the guy starts out and says, uh, the lesson is going to be on spiritual warfare. I thought, you know, I'm a new believer. I don't know all this terminology, but I thought to myself when he said that, I said, no, that sounds cool. This is going to be good. So 
he starts into this and he says, we're going to go right to the source. And he starts out reading Ephesians 6, 12. By the time he got to the end of Ephesians 6, 12, I'm sitting on the couch watching this VHS. And all of a sudden, right in front of my face is this vision of an alien gray. Mm. You know, this, this, this guy over here, this guy over here, right there just as real as can be. And I'm going like, whoa. And then it just morphs into the most horrific thing I had ever seen. And then it was gone. And I said, stop that tape. And they're both freaking out like, what? I said, stop the tape. I got to tell you what I saw. And I shared with them what I had just seen. And they were like floored, you know. You saw that? And I said, yeah. I said, we've been dealing with the wrong thing. And they're like, what? And I said, these aliens ain't aliens. I just got shown. Wow. I said, I don't know how to prove it, but I know what this is. Mm -hmm. And they're like, man, he's got to be right. You know, something that powerful. And I said, I don't know about you guys, make your own choice, but I'm done. I said, I've got plenty here to work with for me to be a Christian and, you know, and, and investigate being a Christian and learning to be one and doing what God wants me to do. But no more UFOs. I'm done. I'll let people know I'm out of it. And uh, my partner said, okay, we're good. Let's, let's move on. I'll join you with more study. I said, uh, okay. About two weeks went by. I get this, I don't know what you call it. People call it small, still voice. I don't know. Can't explain it. it says, you're not done. I went, yeah, I am. This is bad stuff. I'm gonna <laughs> apologize for being part of it. Yeah. You're not done. Oh, yeah, yeah I am. Well, you're not done. Well, if I'm not done, what am I supposed to do with it? You know, nobody told me you don't talk to God like that. Well, I'm a new believer. They didn't tell me everything. So I just keep talking. What do you want me to do with it? Take it back to where you came from. God, if this is you talking, I can't take this back to these people. They don't believe the Bible for being the inerrant word, you know, your inerrant word. They think it's written by a bunch of old guys over a long period of time that who knows what they were smoking, you know? They think it's a lot of good stuff, but yeah. no, not from you. I said, you got to give me something better than that. I figured that hold him off. A couple of weeks went by. There it is again. You already got it. What? You already got it. I'm like, this is too much. I thought aliens were out there. I went and talked to my partner. He's been a Christian a long time. He should know about this stuff. He's like shaking his head. I don't know what you're hearing, but I never heard nothing like this. And I said, bear with me here. What do we got that I'm missing? He says, well, if you're missing it, I'm missing it because I've been a believer all along. I said, then we need to go back and look at what we got. So we did. Went back, looked at, because we were videotaping these talks, you know. And went back, watched a bunch of them, and then all of a sudden, here's this one. This guy says, during his experience, he'd had many experiences, but during this one, he'd recently become a Christian at this little church there in Central Florida. And in he was having this experience, and it was total fear and pain and panic. And the only thing on his mind that he could think of was what they told him in this little church, that if ever in need, call out to Jesus. <laughs> that was the last thing to come to his thinking was what they told him in that little church that he just started going to 
and wow. just became a believer. And he wow. cries out, Jesus, 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 or Jesus, help me. And boom, he falls back in the bed, felt like he was lifted up on a pole. And he falls back on the bed and instantly wakes up the end of the experience. And I thought, wow, oh, that's unheard of. Now, why do mm. I say unheard of? Because all of that research that we had consumed to help those people, to not hurt those people, everywhere in there, there were two things that researchers said. We don't know how to make this stop. And we don't know why this happens to some people. Okay. Well, here, <laughs> we got a guy that says he stopped it. Not just that. It's how he stopped it on top of that. So I'm like, either this is a joke. He's, he's deceived. I don't know. But I can't use this. I got to verify this. This is the only one I've ever heard like this. So my logical thinking says, maybe I should check with these guys. See what they say. So I call up a handful of the top researchers in that time. Secular researchers. that The guys, we read their stuff. And I said, guys... Help me here. I got a case. I don't know what to make of it. They said, tell me what you got. So I shared a story with them. Every one of them, when I shared a story, says, can we go off the record? I said, sure. They're wondering if I'm taping them. So, yeah, whatever. You know, I just, you know, just help me out here. I move on. I told them that. So they know that if they ask for anonymity, I have to give it to them by law. You know, that's part of the signing up for MUFON because we have to respect people's anonymity. And so if anybody watching this, they want to share a testimony, you ask for anonymity, you got it. I have to give you that, you know, by law. I will not share a name. Okay, just so you understand what that means. I've never shared their names to this day, um, these people that I talk to. So we go off the record. I share the story. And they said... Wow. We've come across cases similar to that, where people have said the Lord's Prayer or said a prayer or sang a hymn or hummed a hymn or, you know, um, cried out to Jesus. And I'm going like, well, what, what? wait a minute. We've read all your stuff. We watched your videos. Nowhere do you say this. You say otherwise, that it can't be stopped. Why is that? Well, they all had pretty much the same answer. Um, we didn't know what to make of it. So we didn't cover that yet. You know, I'd have been fine with that. I wouldn't want to say something unless I had an answer to it yet. I would have been fine with that. But you know what? That wasn't their only answer. They they couldn't keep their mouth shut. They always followed with a second excuse. And that second excuse was, we were afraid to go there because it might affect our credibility in the UFO research realm. For people that doubt that this works and doubt that it works in this way, is how many testimonies do you need to see? People actually ask to be abducted by aliens? Yes. I've worked with 20 years of testimonies, but these, they're just amazing and powerful and, and just Christ-focused in a way that is just, it's just, it's shaking me to the core.